The design of a roof affects the appearance of a building and its construction. Proper water drainage from rain and melting snow is an important aspect of roof design. Shed gable and hip roofs are traditional roof designs that have proven practical over thousands of years and are still used in all types of construction. Flat roofs are most often used for building modern houses. A shed roof is the simplest type of roof to construct because they only have one slope. A gable roof has a ridge at the center and slopes in two directions. Hip roof have four sloping sides and are the strongest type of roof because they are braced by four raters, but they are also the most difficult to construct. Two other types of roofs are gambrel and mansard roofs that have doubled slopes on each side and they offer additional living space directly underneath. Butterfly, monitor, and continuous slope roofs are other variations. These basic types of roofs can be combined in various ways to produce interesting designs. A roof that is sloped in two or more directions are formed based on two or more triangles. A shed roof is based on one triangle and a gable roof is based on two triangles. Carpenters need the following information in order to frame a sloped roof. Total span, which is the overall width of a building. Total run, which is half of the total span. And total rise, which is the actual height of the roof measured from the top wall plate to the ridge of the roof. Pitch refers to the angle or the slope of the roof. The amount of the pitch is determined by the unit rise. The unit run indicated along the base of the slope diagram is always 12 inches. The unit rise is the number of inches that the rafter rises vertically for every foot of unit run. Depending on the house and roof design, a moderate roof pitch of 3 inches per foot to 6 inches per foot is an optimal pitch to reduce wind loads. Gable roofs are more susceptible to wind loads than hip roofs. Roof overhangs wider than 2 feet produce higher uplift forces than narrower overhangs. The total rise of a roof must be known before setting the roof ridge to its correct height and attaching the rafters. The total rise is calculated by multiplying the total run by the unit rise. A roof must withstand a great deal of weight and stress. To guarantee structural strength, the dead and live load that a roof will bear must be considered in roof design and construction. Dead load is the weight of the materials used to construct a roof. Roof rafters, sheathing, insulation, and finished covering such as shingles or built-up roofing are included in the dead load. The live load is the weight and pressure of wind and snow to which the roof will be subjected. Flat roofs do not shed snow as easily as pitched roofs. Therefore, in cold climates, flat roofs carry heavier snow loads. Also, rafters for low-pitched roofs must be able to withstand greater live loads than rafters for steeper roofs. Ceiling joists are an important structural factor in roof systems. Ceiling joists secure the tops of the walls in place and prevent the weight of the roof from pushing walls apart. Ceiling joists usually run in the same direction as roof rafters. Ceiling joists are usually spaced 16 inches on center and roof rafters are spaced 24 inches on center. The following nailing schedule is recommended for ceiling joists and roof rafters at exterior wall plates. Ceiling joists to wall plates, toenail 8D nails. Ceiling joists to parallel roof rafters, face nail 316D nails. Rafters to wall plates, toenail 38D nails. Ceiling joists are often wider than roof rafters. Therefore, most of the times, a slope must be cut at each end of ceiling joists using a framing square. One method of strengthening a roof is to install collar ties or collar beams at every second or third pair of rafters. Collar ties should be installed in the upper third area of the attic space and fastened at each end with 8D nails. 
Her limbs support long rafters and are horizontal members placed beneath and perpendicular to the rafters at an intermediate point between the ridge and exterior wall. Purlins are supported by braces that extend to the nearest exterior partition. Extreme weather conditions, such as hurricanes and tornadoes, may generate enough force to significantly damage a roof from the building. Metal connectors, such as rafter and truss anchors, are vital in connecting the wall frame to the roof rafters or trusses. Rafter and truss anchors are nailed to the rafter and into the plates or the studs below. Truss anchors are embedded in grout in the lintel course of a CMU wall, fastened to a CMU or concrete wall screws, or fastened to a wood-framed wall with nails. Sheathing should be nailed to a roof as soon as the framing is complete. Sheathing serves as a base for finishing roof materials and also strengthens the roof structure. Sheathing can be plywood, such as OSB and composite panels, structural insulated panels, and spaced board sheathing. Typically, spaced board sheathing is used as a base for certain types of roof shingles. When OSB is used for roof sheathing, the stamped face should be placed down with the rough side facing up. Panels are placed with a long dimension parallel to the roof ridge and at a right angle to roof rafters. The first row of panels should be in a straight line, and since the end joints of the panels should be staggered, start the second row with a half panel. Roof sheathing should be continuous over two or more rafters. Roof sheathing panels are usually 5 eighths of an inch or more depending on the rafter spacing. Plywood and OSB panels are usually fastened with 8D smooth or ring shank common nails spaced 6 inches on center along the edges and 12 inches on center at intermediate rafters. However, in areas where higher wind loads are anticipated, ring shank or specialized hurricane nails are used and spaced 3 inches on center along the edge and 12 inches on center at intermediate rafters. Number 8 by 1 and 3 quarter inch screws can also be used with the same pattern as with the nails. Next to the shed roof, which has only one slope, the gable roof is the easiest type of pitched roof to build because it slopes only in two directions. The basic structural members of a gable roof are common rafters, gable studs, and ridge board. Gable and gambrel roofs slope in two directions, while shed roofs only slope in one direction. Ridge board serves as a nailing base for the common rafters. Gable studs are upright framing members that provide nailing surface for siding and sheathing at the gable ends of the roof. Common rafters extend from the top wall plates to the ridge. All common rafters for a gable roof are the same length and they can be pre-cut before the roof is assembled. Most common rafters include an overhang. An overhang is the part of a rafter that extends past the building line to the tail cut of the rafter. Plum cuts are made at the ridge, heel, and tail of a common rafter. A seat cut or level cut is made where the rafters rest on the top wall plates. The notch formed by the seat and the heel plumb cut line is referred to as a bird's mouth. The length of the seat cut should be the same width of the wall plates. In addition, the seat cut should not be deeper than one-third the length of a plumb cut. The length of the common rafters is based on the unit rise and total run of the roof. The most efficient way to build a gable roof is to pre-cut all common rafters and then fasten them to the ridge board and the wall plates in a continuous operation. Rafter location should be marked on the top plate when the position of ceiling joists are laid out. Roof rafters are often spaced 24 inches on center and ceiling joists are spaced 16 inches on center. Ridge board, like common rafter, should be pre-cut. Rafter locations are then copied onto the ridge board from the markings on the wall plates. The ridge board should be the length of the building plus the overhang at the gable ends. Lumber used for ridge board should be wider than lumber used for rafters. For example, 
For 2x4 rafters, a 2x6 ridge board should be used. And for 2x6 rafters, a 2x8 ridge board should be used. Ridge board must be at least 1 inch thick and they must be wider than the cut end of the rafters. In some instances, the building might be very long and more than one ridge board might be necessary. The breaks between the ridge should occur at the center of the rafter. One rafter should be used to check for accuracy. If the rafter matches, then it can be used as a template for the other rafters. However, if the walls are not perfectly straight, the rafters might need adjustments. Various methods may be used to set up the ridge board. Plywood panels and OSB boards should be laid on the ceiling joists where the framing will take place. This will provide safe and comfortable footing for carpenters and also provide a place for materials. When only few carpenters are at the job site, the most convenient procedures is to set up the ridge board at the required height and hold it in place with temporary braces and props. Then the rafters are nailed to the ridge board and the top of the wall plates. A faster way to do it when you have a larger crew at the job site is as follows. Lay ridge board flat on ceiling joists. Nail top of two rafters close to each end of ridge board. Raise ridge board and two rafters into position. Nail seat ends of the two rafters to double top plate. Nail two rafters on opposite sides of ridge board. Plumb ridge board at the gable end and hold it in place with temporary brace. Position and nail remainder of rafters and install fascia board. Common rafter overhang can be pre-cut before the rafters are installed. But some carpenters prefer to do it after the rafters are fastened to the ridge board and wall plates. A chalk line is used to mark the overhang on the rafters and a sliding T-bevel is used to mark a plumb cut. Then, the cuts are made using a circular saw. This method ensures that the line of the overhang is straight, even if the building is not. Another overhang is formed over each gable end of a building. The main framing members of the gable end overhang are fascia rafters. Fascia rafters are fastened to the ridge board at one end and to the fascia board at the other end. Fascia boards are often nailed to the tail end of common rafters to serve as a finish piece at the edge of a roof. By extending past the gable ends of the house, fascia boards also help to support the fascia rafters. At each end, vertical members called gable studs are placed. Gable studs decrease in length from the ridge section toward the exterior side walls. Gable studs provide gable wall structure and support rafters along their bottom edges. Gambrel roof is basically a gable roof with double slope on each side. The double slope is created by two common rafters that meet between the top of the wall and ridge. The rafters must be supported either by a wall or by purlins and posts where the rafters meet. In this image, the meeting points of the upper and lower rafter is supported by walls. When constructing a gambrel roof, the lower portion of the roof is constructed first. If the attic space provided by a gambrel roof is to be used for a living area, the subfloor should be installed before roof framing begins. The two outside rows of subfloor panels should be held back or cut so the seat of the rafters can easily be nailed to the top of the wall plates. A recommended procedure to install a gambrel roof is as follows. Install and temporarily brace partitions. Install lower slope common rafters. Install ridge board and upper slope common rafters. Fasten collar tie to every third set of rafters. A shed roof only has one slope. Common rafters of a shed roof are marked at each end for seat cuts where the rafters will rest on two opposite walls of the building. The rafters are also marked for overhang cuts on each end. The length of the common rafters is based on the unit rise of the roof and the total run. Dormers add space and provide light and ventilation 
to a one and one and a half story house or to an attic area. Dormers require a roof with a steep slope and a high ridge. Gambrel roofs are usually well suited for dormer constructions. Most dormers are of gable or shed design. The gable dormer consists of a ridge board, common rafters, valley, rafters, and valley jack rafters. The front wall of a shed dormer is usually directly over the exterior wall of a building. The dormer rafters extend from the main ridge board. They must be pitched enough to shed water and snow. When an opening is framed, the rafters on both sides and the headers at the top and bottom must be doubled. A hip roof has four sloping sides. Four hip rafters run at a 45 degree angle on plan view from the corners of the building to the ridge board. Hip jack rafters frame the space between the hip rafters and the tops of the exterior walls. Common rafters for hip roofs extend from the ridge board to the wall plates, similar to gable roofs. The king common rafter extends from the ends of the ridge board to the top plate. Another common rafter, commonly called the side king common rafter, extends from the end of the ridge board at a 90 degree angle. Hip rafter is longer than a common rafter and the unit run is higher than a common rafter. In addition to plumb cuts at the ridge, heel, and tail, a hip rafter requires side cuts where it meets the ridge. Side cuts are also necessary at the tail in order for the overhang of the hip rafters to align with the overhang of the common rafters. Since hip rafters run at a diagonal, its overhang is longer than the common rafter overhang. The run of a hip rafter overhang is approximately 1.42 inches for every 1 inch of common rafter overhang. A framing square can also be used to calculate the run of hip rafter overhang. Chamfering the top edges of a hip rafter is called backing the rafters. Backing prevents roof sheathing from being higher where it covers hip rafters than where it covers common and jack rafters. Another method to prevent roof sheathing from being higher over hip rafters is dropping the hip rafters. The seat cut is enlarged, causing the rafter to drop. Consequently, the sheathing rests on the top corners of the rafter and is in line with the roof. Most carpenters use the dropping method because it is faster than the backing method. Hip jack rafters frame the space between hip rafters and wall plates. Hip jack rafters run in pairs and are spaced the same distance apart as common rafters. If common rafters are spaced 24 inches on center, the hip jack rafters are spaced 24 inches on center. Hip jack rafters decrease in length as they get closer to the end of a building. The main framing members for hip roofs should be pre-cut prior to constructing the roofs. After the ridge board is cut to length, the layout markings for rafter placement can be transferred from the top wall plates to the ridge board. Collar ties may be placed at every second or third pair of rafters. Purlins and partition wall braces might be added as needed. The following is a general procedure for installing hip roofs components. Position and nail all common rafters that meet at the two ends of a ridge board. Position and nail hip rafters at corners of building. Position and nail hip jack rafters and remaining common rafters. An intersecting roof, also known as a combination roof, consists in two or more sections sloping in different directions. A valley is formed where the different sloping sections are joined. The two sections of an intersecting roof may or may not be the same width. If the two sections are the same width, the roof is said to have equal spans. If the two sections are not the same width, the roof is said to have unequal spans. In a roof with equal spans, the total rise or height is the same for the two ridges. 
where the slopes of the roof meet to form a valley between the two sections, a pair of valley rafters are placed. Valley rafters extend from the inside corners formed by the two sections of the building to the corners formed by the intersecting ridges. Valley jack rafters run from the valley rafters to the ridges. Hip valley cripple jack rafters are placed between the valley rafter and hip rafter. In intersecting roofs with equal spans, valley rafters run at a 45 degree angle to the exterior walls of a building and are parallel to hip rafters. Therefore, valley rafters are the same length as hip rafters. The layout of a valley rafter is almost identical to the layout of a hip rafter. The side cut angles for valley rafters are the same as the angles for hip rafters. The only difference in layout occurs at the seat and tail of the valley rafter. Side cuts must be angled back at the heel plumb cut line to allow the valley rafter to drop down inside the corner of the building. Side cuts are also required at the tail of the overhang so that the corner formed by the valley will align with the rest of the roof overhang. Note that unlike hip rafters, valley rafters do not require backing or dropping in an equal span roof, but they may require dropping in an unequal span roof. If the two sections are not the same width, the roof is said to have unequal spans. An intersecting roof with unequal spans requires a supporting valley rafter to run from the inside corner formed by two sections of the building to the main ridge. A shorter valley rafter runs from the other inside corner of the building to the supporting valley rafter. Similar to an intersecting roof with equal spans, an intersecting roof with unequal spans also requires valley jack rafters and hip valley cripple jack rafters. In addition, a valley cripple jack rafter is placed between the supporting valley rafter and shortened valley rafters. An intersecting roof with unequal spans requires two types of valley rafters, supporting and shortened. A supporting valley rafter extends from the wall plate to the ridge board and has a single side cut where it fits against the ridge board. A shortened valley rafter runs at a 90 degree angle to the supporting valley rafter. Shortened valley rafters have a square cut where they butt against the supporting valley rafter. The length of a shortened valley rafter is based on the run of the narrower roof. When hip and valley rafters are placed close together, the space between them is framed with hip valley cripple jack rafters, and all of them have the same length. A framing square rafter table, or a book of rafter tables, can be used to find the length of hip valley cripple jack rafters. Valley cripple jack rafters are used only on intersecting roofs with unequal spans. Valley cripple jack rafters are placed between the shortened and supporting valley rafters to bridge the space in the main roof section between the supporting and shortened valley rafters. The run of a valley cripple jack rafter is always twice the run of the valley jack rafter that it meets at the shortened valley rafter. For this reason, the length of a valley cripple jack rafter is also twice the length of that valley jack rafter. The following is an example for framing an intersecting roof with equal spans. In this example, both sections of the intersecting roof are gable roofs. Install main ridge board and four supporting end common rafters. Install intersecting ridge board. Nail intersecting end to main ridge board and install two end common rafters at the end of intersecting ridge boards. Install two valley rafters running from the main ridge board to inside the building corner. Install valley jack rafters. Install remaining common rafters. The framing procedure for an intersecting roof with unequal spans differs somewhat from the procedure for a roof with equal spans. In a roof with unequal spans, the main ridge board is higher than the ridge board of the smaller roof. Install main ridge board supported by two corner hip rafters and one common rafter at each end. 
Install supporting and shortened valley rafters. Install intersecting ridge board. A 45 degree cut is required at the end that fastens to the valley rafters. Install pair of common rafters at end of intersecting ridge board. Install remaining common rafters on main and intersecting roofs. Install hip jack rafters, valley jack rafters, hip valley cripple jack rafters. When nailing valley jack rafters to valley rafter, hold two jack rafters a little higher than top surface of valley rafter. This allows roof sheathing to touch center of valley rafter. Blind valley construction is a method of building intersecting roofs without valley rafters. The main roof is sheathed and the intersecting section is built on top of the sheathing. One by six boards are fastened to the top of the sheathing as a base for nailing the valley jacks. The valley jack rafters require a seat cut combined with a side cut where they fasten to the one by six board. Blind valley construction does not require valley rafters.